Welcome back to 10-Minute Prophecy, where we go through the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation in bite-sized chunks. We hope that this journey through Bible prophecy has been enlightening, whether you are new to prophecy or have studied prophecy in the past. As always, if you haven't seen the previous presentations, please watch them as each prophecy builds on each other. Now, we have seen in the comments that there is some questions about using the day-for-year principle. We would like to address this briefly. This is a non-denominational biblical principle and is supported by biblical scholars and interpreters such as Augustine, Tychonius, Primatius, Andreas, the Venerable Bede, Ambrosius, Ansbertus, Berengord, and Bruno Estensis. Not to mention that the biblical writers themselves, who in Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6 and Numbers chapter 14 verse 34, spell out this principle. These verses are in connection with prophecies of Israel. Also, this has been a principle of Bible prophecy interpretation all throughout Christian history until recently, when the church has been infiltrated with non-biblical prophecy interpretation methods. Before we begin, we're going to review the major themes of the book of Daniel that we have learned up until this point. Daniel 2 shows us the kingdoms of this earth and the coming of Jesus. Daniel 7 shows us the kingdoms of this earth, the time of the end, which is 1798, and that there is a judgment that starts before Jesus comes. Daniel 8 and 9 shows us the kingdoms of this earth and how they affect God's people from Israel to the Christian age, and that there is a judgment and cleansing of the sanctuary at the end of the 2300-day prophecy, which is 1844, before Jesus comes. Do you see the magnification of each prophecy? Now, Daniel 11 will show us the kingdoms of this earth, what will happen between 1844 and when Michael stands up and Jesus coming back. We found out in Daniel chapter 10 that Michael is not another angel, as is popularly believed, but rather it is another name of Jesus. So what the prophecies of Daniel tell us is that the time between 1844 and Jesus' second coming is the most important era in the history of mankind. Now, Daniel chapter 11 shows us exactly what is going to happen between 1844 and Jesus' second coming. Now, Daniel 10, 11 and 12 is one unit, so keep this in mind. This prophecy, more than any of the previous prophecies, details out our current situation. You will see this in the last part of the Daniel 11 series. So, let's begin Daniel 11. What is unique about this vision is that it is largely given in plain language with some symbols. As mentioned before, you will see that this is the magnification of Daniel 8 and 9, and with almost microscopic precision, God spells out the rise and fall of specific people in the kingdoms, as well as the kingdoms themselves, all the way to our time. We will also see the rise of the Little Horn Power in exact detail. It is really amazing. This shows that God's Word is not just made up, but is an actual book we can rely on for wisdom and knowledge. It also confirms the interpretation, as we will discover. Now, the identity of the King of the North and the King of the South changes because they represent certain kingdoms and the leaders that represent them. And then, at the end of the chapter, it will also include philosophies with the kingdom's powers. This will be apparent in the context as we go along. We will start our study with verses 1 and 2. Also, I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I, stood to confirm and to strengthen him, and now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Now notice in plain language Gabriel begins to talk about the vision, and also notice that it is a magnification of Daniel 8, because we see both Persia and Greece. This is the anchor in history, which we have to use as our starting point. Now notice the detail. Gabriel says that there will be three kings in Persia, but the fourth will be the richest of all of them, and he will seek to gather up an army to fight Greece. When we look back in history and count the four kings after Cyrus, we come to Xerxes, who was far richer than all who came before him. Xerxes is best known for his immense wealth rather than his military skill, and for leading a famously grand but ultimately failed campaign against Greece. He rallied an unprecedented number of soldiers for war. According to the historian Herodotus, Xerxes' army totaled over five million men, 
Not only did he recruit from the east, but he also brought in 300,000 men from Carthage in the west, bringing the total force to over 5.5 million. As Xerxes gazed over his enormous army, it's said that he wept, realizing that in 100 years, none of them would still be alive. Now, let's look at verses three and four. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and shall be divided toward the four winds of heaven and not to his posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up, even for others beside those. Now Xerxes was the last Persian king to invade Greece, and after him, the prophecy identifies Alexander the Great. Alexander defeated the Persian Empire and became its ruler, controlling even more territory than any Persian king before him. His empire was vast, covering most of the known world at the time, and he acted with absolute power. However, in 323 BC, Alexander's life ended in a drunken binge and all his grand plans abruptly collapsed. The empire didn't go to his posterity, as the Bible says. Instead, it was torn apart. Within 15 years of his death, all of Alexander's heirs had been killed due to the ambition and jealousy of his top generals. His empire was divided among four of his most powerful or ambitious generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus and Ptolemy. This story is a reminder of how quickly the highest levels of earthly glory can give way to death and obscurity. Verse 5 starts with this, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, and he shall be strong above him, and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. Let's review how Alexander's generals divided the kingdom after his death. The regions around Palestine were split among his generals, Cassander took control of Greece and nearby areas to the west. Lysimachus ruled Thrace, which included Asia Minor and lands around the Hellespont and Bosporus to the north of Palestine. Seleucus controlled Syria and Babylon, located mainly to the east, and Ptolemy governed Egypt and the surrounding regions to the south. Now, when we look at history, what we find is that the generals begin to fight and eventually the different kingdoms become consolidated to the kingdom of the north and the kingdom of the south as the Bible identifies them. This is what happened. Cassander was soon defeated by Lysimachus, who took over Greece and Macedon, adding them to Thrace. Later, Lysimachus was defeated by Seleucus, who then added Macedon and Thrace to his control over Syria. This sets the stage for understanding the prophecy. The king of the south refers to Egypt, which grew strong under Ptolemy, who added Cyprus, Phoenicia, Korea, Cyrene, and many islands and cities to Egypt, strengthening his kingdom. However, the phrase one of his princes refers to another of Alexander's generals. And the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his Alexander's princes shall be stronger than him. This points to Seleucus, who, after adding Macedon and Thrace to Syria, controlled three quarters of Alexander's former empire, making his kingdom more powerful than Egypt's. Moving on to verse six, we find, and in the end of years, they shall join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain the power of the arm. Neither shall he stand nor his arm, but she shall be given up and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. There were frequent wars between the kings of Egypt and Syria, especially during the reigns of Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second king of Egypt, and Antiochus Theos, the third king of Syria. Eventually, they made peace on the condition that Antiochus would divorce his wife Laodice and their two sons, and marry Berenice, the daughter of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Ptolemy brought his daughter to Antiochus along with a huge dowry. However, Berenice's influence over Antiochus didn't last long. Soon after, in a change of heart, Antiochus brought Laodis and their children back to court. As the prophecy predicted, neither Antiochus nor his children with Berenice would remain in power. Laodis, fearing that Antiochus might abandon her again for Berenice, arranged to have him poisoned. After his death, Laodice ensured that her eldest son, Seleucus Callinicus, took the throne, preventing Berenice's children from succeeding. But she, Berenice, shall be given up. 
Laodice, not satisfied with poisoning her husband Antiochus, also arranged for Berenice to be murdered. And they that brought her refers to Berenice's Egyptian attendants, many of whom were killed while trying to protect her. And he that begat her, or as the original says whom she brought forth, refers to her son, who was also murdered on Laodice's orders. And he that strengthened her in these times would mean her husband Antiochus and those who supported and defended her. But such cruelty and wickedness didn't go unpunished, as both prophecy and history confirm. Verses 7 through 9 state, But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army, and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them, and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods, with their princes, and with their precious vessels of silver and of gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom, and shall return into his own land. The branch from the same root, this refers to Berenice's brother, Ptolemy Euergetes. After succeeding his father, Ptolemy Philadelphus, as king of Egypt, he was determined to avenge his sister's death. Ptolemy raised a massive army and invaded the territory of the king of the north, Seleucus Callinicus, who ruled Syria with his mother, Laodice. Ptolemy was victorious, conquering Syria, Cilicia, lands beyond the Euphrates, and much of Asia. However, when news of a rebellion in Egypt reached him, Ptolemy returned home, but not before looting Seleucus' kingdom. He took 40,000 talents of silver, valuable treasures, and 2,500 statues of gods, including those Cambyses had stolen from Egypt and taken to Persia years earlier. The Egyptians, being deeply devoted to their gods, honored Ptolemy with the title Euergetes, meaning benefactor, for returning their long-lost idols. After Laodice killed Antiochus, Berenice and her child Ptolemy, the son of Philadelphus, sought revenge. He invaded Syria, killed Laodice, and advanced as far as Babylon. According to Polybius, Ptolemy Euergetes, outraged by the cruel treatment of his sister Berenice, led an army into Syria and captured the city of Seleucia, which remained under Egyptian control for several years. This marked his entry into the stronghold of the King of the North. Ptolemy took control of the region from Mount Taurus to India without a battle. As foretold by the prophecy, the King of the South entered the territory of the King of the North and then returned to Egypt. Ptolemy outlived Seleucus Callinicus, who died in exile after falling from his horse by four or five years. Now verse 10 starts with, But his sons shall be stirred up, and shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come, and overflow, and pass through. Then shall he return, and be stirred up, even to his fortress. The first part of this verse mentions sons, plural, while the latter part refers to just one, singular. Seleucus Callinicus had two sons, Seleucus Caronus and Antiochus Magnus. Both were eager to avenge their father and restore their country's honor. Seleucus Caronus the Elder took the throne first. He gathered a large army to reclaim his father's lands, but being a weak ruler with little money and poor leadership, he struggled to control his troops. After a short, unimpressive reign of two or three years, he was poisoned by two of his generals. His younger brother, Antiochus Magnus, then became king. He took command of the army, recaptured Seleucia, and regained control of Syria, sometimes through negotiation, other times by force. After a period of negotiations and preparation for war, Antiochus defeated Nicholas, the Egyptian general, and even considered invading Egypt. This is the one who would successfully sweep through and conquer. Did you notice the detail and the plain language in which Daniel 11 discusses the intricate details of the kingdoms? Isn't it amazing? Doesn't studying the prophecies this way want you to know more? Well, this concludes our time together. Join us for another exciting session as we continue to discuss Daniel chapter 11. Please remember to like and subscribe. If you are enjoying this series so far or have any questions, please comment below. Hope to see you soon.